Today, we're diving right back into the book of Romans, chapter 9. If you've been following along, if you haven't, it's okay. But I am going to be giving you homework, all right? So for next week, I'm going to ask that you read chapter 10 before we get there next week. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire of effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and then my name would be proclaimed in all the earth. <clears throat> therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens who he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who resists his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why do you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out the same lump of clay, some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the object of his wrath, prepared for, this, for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us whom he called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the Israelites be like the stand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved, for the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us, left us descendants, we would have become like Saddam. We, have, we would have been like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. But as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. We read chapter 9, and we're starting to get into some really heavy stuff uh, called the sovereignty of God. Everybody say the sovereignty of God. He is sovereign, and sovereign is like a dad who says to his children, um, because I said so. 
or a mom who has to look at her um, 13 year old who's trying to test her um, and he doesn't think that he needs to do what mom says anymore until um, she goes crazy on him right and puts him back into his place and explains to him um, that whether he is bigger than her or not what she says goes so uh, Bumi uh, keeps that ace up her sleeve. Every now and then she does um, break it out to make sure that the boys knows uh, where she is coming from. Amen. And so the sovereignty of God is, is just that, is that God is the one who is in control. God is the one who has all power and all authority under heaven and earth. Okay. And the Apostle Paul is trying to get the people in Rome to understand this aspect of God. Because it's very difficult to understand the sovereignty of God. It's very difficult for us to understand what, and, and, and come to the, uh, the, the realization that not everybody will be saved. Not everybody will go to heaven. You know, we've all been to funerals where everybody tends to say all the right things. And I can't wait to be with them in heaven. I can't wait to be up there with them in heaven. Um, and you know, in some cases that's true. In other cases, guess what? Some folks may not be in heaven. Me as a preacher, it would be cheap if I got up here every time I did a funeral and say, oh, you know what? They're in a better place. Oh, you know, they're in heaven now. And sometimes we don't know that. Sometimes we don't know if that person received Jesus Christ. We don't know if that person put their trust in Jesus. We don't know if that person believed that Jesus was God and that forgave them of their sins and so that their sins could be forgiven and that they would have eternal life and abundant life in heaven. We don't know these things and all of those kinds of things and all judgment in any kind of condemn condemnation or salvation is reserved for God and God alone. We are not the people who save people. We are just vessels of God. We are instruments of God. We are mouthpieces of God that simply communicate the truths of God by virtue of what we have learned in God's word and, and rightly divide scriptures to, in a way that people can understand them and then be able to make decisions for themselves and decide how they will live their lives here on earth and what they are preparing themselves for in eternity whether etern eternal salvation or eternal condemnation. Today, I'd like to give the message a title, Speak the Truth in Love. Speak the Truth in Love. Right now, there's a great truth movement that's going on. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And it's better to live in truth. It's better to, be, to live in honesty, and it's better to, to live your life in such a way that, that we don't hold or withhold anything back from people that we live with or people that we know. It's kind of like being able to live with a full sense of integrity in our beings. Um, there's also a very, very um, difficult movement that's going on that's called hashtag me too. How many of you have read that or heard of that? Do you know what that is when anybody, whether it's male or female, have been um, sexually assaulted or, or abused in any, or taken advantage in any sort of way? And it might be a touchy subject because here we are, we're all part of, you know, we all go through life and lots of things have happened. The only reason why I bring this up is because um, there's a lot of things that are being said now where people are, are really being honest about what has happened. And it's been able to liberate them and how they've been able to conquer these things that have actually had a grip on them for so long. And here now we have chapter nine of Romans. Paul, in verse 1, says this, I speak truth in Christ. He says, Lego aletheia en Christo. I speak truth in Christ. Well, Christ is love, so I'd like to say, I speak truth in love. Paul wants to make sure that the truths that he's about to explain to the church in Rome are understood so that they would have a, a very truthful understanding of what is required and what is necessary to attain salvation. How many of you who, how many of you know folks that you love with all your heart, but there, is, there are some things that are very, very difficult to tell them or to speak to them about? Raise your hand. Put your hands down. How many of you have ever approached somebody that you knew you, need, you needed to speak to and you had to ask God to give you the words? You had to ask the Holy Spirit to give you the right frame of mind and the right heart to speak to those individuals 
in love, but to speak truth. There's a way to communicate truths to people so that we don't run them away or cause them to feel that we're trying to judge them or we're trying to tell them how to live or we're trying to tell them how to be. But as Christians, we owe it not only to ourselves, but we owe it to one another to be able to speak truth in love. Paul says, I speak truth in Christ. I speak truth in Christ. And surely this is not permission just to go up to anybody that we want and say, you know what? You want to know the truth? <laughs> This is not permission to go to that, that person that you've been holding, you know, that, that thing that you wanted to tell them all along and, and to just go and just let them have it because now you want to speak truth. That's not that kind of thing either. There's a balance and there's a way to handle truth. There's a way to handle difficult situations. Paul is speaking to the church in Rome, both to Jews and to Gentiles. So who are the Jews? The Jews were God's chosen people. The Jews were people that, that, that God had called unto himself, starting with Abraham. And because Abraham put his faith in God, God said, now you will be a father of many nations. And through Abraham came a covenant that he, and a promise that he established with that people, that progeny that came through Abraham. Abraham originally came from Iraq. He's a Chaldean. He came from the Ur of Chaldees, where they had pagan gods and they worshiped multiple gods. They worshiped the sun and the moon and the stars and the God of nature and the God of this and the God of fire and the God of fertility. And they had all these types of, you know, religions and, and, and pagan styles of worship. But God called Abraham and said, I am beginning to um, establish a relationship with you and to the many children that will come after you. Not just biological children. Abraham's like, um, I'm, I'm kind of old and I don't know if I can have children. He says, don't worry, you're going to be, you're gonna, uh, be the uh, spiritual father of many nations and you'll also be the, the biological father of many nations. And Abraham said, okay, I'll take your word for it. And that's where it began. God credited to Abraham as righteousness and made Abraham right in God's eyes. He established it there. And the people of Israel that were a part of this lineage of Abraham, okay, and, and Isaac and Jacob, had this rich tradition and inheritance of, of establishing this, this relationship with Almighty God. Think about that for a moment. This is very, very special. Until you get four or five, six, seven generations away and they begin to forget about the relationship. They forget about the covenant. They forget about the promises and the conditions of loving this God. And then they start to veer off. But they still want to hold on to the good stuff. And they still want to say, but we are descendants of our father, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And, and, and they want to hold on to all of that good stuff and all the blessings that come along with that. But they forgot that God's not interested in all of these types of um, blessings and goodness that, that he wants to give them unless they also love him back. Because God is a jealous God. Are you with me so far? Amen. So these are the Jews. These are the Israelites. These are the children of Israel. OK, Israel, that they were named after Abra uh, Abraham's grandson. And his name was Jacob, and his name later was, was converted, changed into Israel. And so all of their descendants after that were called after the name of Israel. So they're called Israelites. And so here we have these people. And the Apostle Paul, before he, he be, uh, chose to follow Jesus, before Paul was completely converted and redirected his path, he was one who also served to worship God, except he didn't want anything to do with this man named Jesus because he didn't trust that Jesus truly was the Messiah. He didn't trust that Jesus was the true anointed one who came through the lineage of Abraham biologically and also was the son of God, the Messiah that the Jews had been expecting and reading about and waiting for for thousands of years. They did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah because he didn't look like a Messiah that they were anticipating. 
He didn't come riding in on a horse, with, on a stallion. He didn't come riding in with the big, huge flowing robe. He didn't come riding in with the big, huge crown. Jesus didn't come in to, to even remove the oppression of the Roman government. Jesus fell under all of that, and he changed the paradigm of what a servant king looked like. He changed the paradigm of what the Messiah was to look like, and that's why a lot of people were not able to trust that Jesus was the Messiah and that they did not put their faith in Jesus. And so there's this tension between the, between the Jews here in Rome and the Gentiles because the Jews that were starting to put their trust in Jesus, if you ever read the book of Hebrews in the Bible, you'll see that some of them said, I don't know about this Jesus thing, man. I think I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating going back to my old, my old roots. I'm contemplating going back to my old way of faith, my old way of religion. You know, my, you know it's some, come from, some of us come from different backgrounds and different faiths and different practices, different types of churches that, you know, flat out are not following the ways of Jesus. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm contemplating going back there. My family is disowning me. And they're saying that I'm a traitor now. They don't even invite me to the, the birthday parties anymore. They don't even invite me over to my nephew's um, baptism. They don't do this they don't, because I, I, I'm going to a Christian or a Protestant church. And those are some of the things that Paul was talking about. And he's trying to explain to the church in Rome. And he wants to do it in love. Look at some of the things that he says. I'm, I am not lying, he says. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish I could myself be cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. For those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sons. They were the descendants of Abraham. They have a rightful heir a rightful claim on the throne of God because they come from Abraham. But the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites, had gotten so far away from the heart of God. They had gotten so far away from the heart of God that Jesus said, it's time for me to go now so we can bring them back to God's heart. It's kind of like on Sundays we've been preaching uh, about the, the, the prodigal son and how the older son in that story had forgotten about the heart of God. He was so disconnected and so far removed from the heart of his own father that when his own brother, who was lost and practically dead, comes back into the scene, guess what? He rejects him. And he says he doesn't deserve anything. He doesn't deserve forgiveness. He doesn't deserve mercy. He doesn't deserve grace. He doesn't, de he doesn't deserve any of the blessings or the covering that my father has to offer. You squandered all of your inheritance. The older brother forgot about God's heart. And that's exactly what happened with the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites. They had forgotten that it was all about salvation of the lost. But they were too busy going around pointing out who they thought. Mm, nope, you're not a Jew. To hell with you. Literally. Oh, you No, you're not one of us. You're not circumcised. You're a Gentile. A Gentile was simply anybody who was not a Jew. And so you can you can imagine the conflict, you know. Oh, you know what? They're not. They're only half. You know, they're only, you know, a half of, of, of our, you know, heritage. They come from that side of the family on the other side of the tracks. They don't have the true Mexican blood. That's the kind of stuff that was going on. But Paul says, no, hold up, slow down. I am going to have to speak the truth in Christ. He says, and let the Holy Spirit attest that I am not lying. You want to you want to know what Paul just did right there? Some of us have learned this. He just sweared on God's name. He says, and by the account of the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you that I'm not lying, and I'm going to speak it in truth. And then he calls these people to himself because he wanted so bad for the Jews to see that Jesus was the Messiah. He wanted them to understand and experience the forgiveness and the mercy that he received and the greatest way that he could communicate that was 
in this chapter 9 and in all the rest of the chapters of the book of Romans. Look in verse 5, it says, Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It's not as though God's word had failed. Watch this. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac, Abraham's son, back in the Old Testament, that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. The children of the promise are the ones who put their faith in God the way Abraham did. So he's saying it's not even the lineage, it's not the blood line of Abraham. It's now, not just now, but Paul is emphasizing, he's emphatically stating it's those who are going to act like children. Have any of you ever watched that movie called Billy Madison? If you haven't watched it, don't go and watch it. It's, it's kind of crude and, you know, I wouldn't recommend it, um, especially with, with children around. All right. But Billy Madison's got this amazing. I probably should have just told you I, I, I saw a movie. I probably just should have just told you I saw a movie and this is what the story, but I don't mind telling you. It was Billy Madison. And in this movie is this father who is just rich, lives in a huge mansion, and he's got a son who's like a slappy. Do you know what a slappy is? He's like a 30-something-year-old son who never finished elementary, middle school, junior high, or ever went to college. He's a loser. He sits out by the pool, drinks beer all day, sleeps during the day, parties at night. He's got a whole bunch of friends that he parties with. And his father has this huge company. And his father's getting to the age where he's ready to turn the company over to somebody else. And he wants to slow down, enjoy his money. And he looks around and he goes, I can't give it to my son. And he goes, who do I have next to me? And I forget the guy's names, but he's got, he's got you know, Tweedledee number one and Tweedledum over here, number two. And the one guy on the right hand is like a snake in the grass. His name is Eric. And Eric is doing everything to try and just squash his son and make him look like a loser, erase him from the will, erase him from ever being able to inherit anything related to this man's millions. He's a snake, and he tries to do everything to puff himself up and make himself look good. Over here is the other guy. I forget his name. He's kind of quiet. He just stays back. He doesn't have a big role in the movie, but he's consistent, and he's faithful, and he's loyal, and he does right by the man and also by his son, trying to help the, the son clean up. Finally, when the son realizes that the father wants to give him everything that he has, including his business, but that he is not ready, he's not mature, he doesn't even have an education, he's so immature, he would run the business to the ground, he'd lose it, he'd waste it all. The son goes, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to clean up my act. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to show my father and prove to him that I'm worthy of the inheritance. So the son goes back to elementary school. He has to pass all the tests, and he falls in love with the teacher. And they get married and live happily ever after. Then he goes to middle school with the O'Doyles. And he passes middle school. Then he goes to high school, and he graduates from high school, and he takes his cap, and he throws the cap, and, oh, man, he's on his way to bigger and better things. Just when he has proven to his father that he's trustworthy and he's ready to take on great things and, and he's, he's mature enough to take on the company and make big decisions. Finally, this guy over here, Eric, he just, he starts, you know, inching forward and, and, then, and then he and, and Billy Madison, this dude, they have like this, this face off and this huge, huge like um, triathlon and all this other academic, you know, gymnastics that they have to go through. But at the end of the day, after proving to his father that he is worthy, and the father said, you, de you, you earned it, you deserved it. He says, the company's yours. And he goes, yeah, you know what? Actually, I'm not the one that's meant to do that. It's this guy over here who's been waiting in the wings all along and has done everything right, who has acted more like a son 
than he did originally. And this guy over here is just an imposter. He's just in it for all the wrong reasons. He didn't get it. He didn't get what it was all about. Right. But that son was not worthy of the inheritance until he actually was able to prove by virtue of how he began to live his life that he could be even acknowledged or have the possibility of, of doing those things. And that's that's kind of what we see right here. And thankful for Paul, he began to explain to people and unpack the importance of putting faith in Jesus. And that's why he says, I speak truth in love. I'm reminded of the passage in Proverbs chapter 27, 6, where it says, if you have your Bibles, you could turn with me there and highlight that. I love this. It says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You know, be weary of people who flatter you. Be weary of people who tell you you look good all the time. Be weary of people. Proverbs 27, 6. Be weary of people who, who um, just praise you all the time and say good things about you because you really don't know what they're saying behind your back. Be weary of those kinds of people. But when somebody loves you enough to sit you down and to speak truth and love, like Paul did the Jews and other Gentiles, it wasn't that the Gentiles were going to be the ones to, 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 to attain the inheritance either. It was only Gentiles who put their faith in Jesus. So it wasn't like one people group versus the other. No, it was any person who called upon the name of Jesus would receive salvation and be saved. And Paul says, wounds from a friend can be trusted. Oh, man, my heart was broken a couple of weeks ago. We we're all wrestling and running around the house, me, Boomy, and the boys. And, you know, my boys are 11, 9, and the baby's 1. The baby, she started to formulate words and say words and stuff like that. And my, my uh, middle son, Judah, he comes to me and goes, Dad, I have something to tell you, Dad. And I'm like, oh, man, here it comes. And I just, you know, I love you, or you're so amazing, or like... Like, I just always want to be with you. And I'm like, what, Judah? Come here, mijo. He goes, Daddy, I love you, but your breath stinks. <laughs> I'm like, hey, praise God, Judah. Truth in love, truth in love. So I went to the bathroom, and I, I, and I uh, threw some mouthwash in my mouth. And I said, All right, how's it smell now, Judah? It's better. I was like, ah, wounds from a friend can be trusted. <laughs> wounds from a friend can be trusted. Did I ever tell you about the, the guy who, who uh, was trying to make fun of me in front of a whole crowd of people? You, heard, you remember that story? How many of you didn't, never heard that story? So he wanted to give me this little gift, and it's me and my father. It's at the end of a whole week where we were the chaplains for uh, the, the racetrack chaplains of America, RTCA, over here in Redondo Beach at the uh, Crown, Crown Plaza Hotel or something like that. Crown Royal Plaza. I don't know. Anyway. He's like, I got, an, I got a gift for you. And he, he brought my dad up and he gave my dad the gift. And I'm like, oh, thank you so much like that. And then I came up, you know, and he, he wanted to make jest of me. And so um, he came and, and he went like this and he handed out the book. And I was like, oh, like this. And then, and then he pulled it away and I was like, oh, <laughs> like that. He did it again. I was like, surely he's going to give me the book this time. And he, he gave it to me again and I went to grab it and he, he pulled it back again. And they all just started roaring. By this time, I'm turning like red as Christina's sweatshirt back there, you know. And I'm like, he, he, then he went to go, oh, okay, here I go. He went like that to hand out the book, you know. Um, and, then, and then I just stood there like looking at him like this. And he's just like, here's the book. I go, I don't want your book. <laughs> I don't want your book. He goes, no, really, I won't do it anymore. I go, no, don't worry about that. You could keep your book. I trust his right hand, but I don't trust yours. Just like that. And um, he wanted to make a fool of me in front of everybody like that. So I let him keep his book, and I, I didn't accept it. And um, it's kind of just a, it's kind of a messed up little funny story, actually. Um, but... It, it just it goes to it just goes to underline the fact right there. You can trust wounds from a brother, but somebody you don't know, 
you know, you're not going to be able, you're not just going to go and accept criticism from anybody. You know, we get people that come in here, you know, claim to be apostles and prophets and something like that. And it's their first time coming here to our church sometimes. And, and they said, you know what, I want to tell you, you know, you know what would make this church grow? And my, my dad will be like, oh, yeah, are, are you a tither? Is this your first time here? Like, no, I don't tithe. I've never come here before. He goes, you can keep that prophecy then. I don't, I don't know you. I don't, I don't, I don't trust that word. It's, you know, well. But we could trust, you can trust wounds from a friend. You know, somebody says, hey, man, let, you know, somebody, let, let's grab some coffee. You know, that, hey, can we go get something to eat? Hey, there's something I want to talk to you about. And you know people that, that have your best interest in mind and that need to have those tough conversations. And that's what Paul was doing here with the people in Rome. I speak truth, he says, in Christ. If, if I don't share this with you, you may live the rest of your life not really knowing whether you're saved or not. Does that make sense? You know, I got to hand it to even Jehovah's Witness. I don't believe in their doctrine. They got it all wrong. They don't believe Jesus is God. They believe Jesus is a teacher. They believe that Jesus was a prophet. But they don't believe that Jesus is God. And, uh, but I have to hand it to them because they work. They go after it. They, not knowing, because God is sovereign, not knowing whether or not they received salvation or not. You know, they only believe that 144,000 people will go to heaven. And we know that there are far more Jehovah's Witness people than 144,000, not only in the world today, but who have ever lived. But the way they go about living their lives and practicing their you know, imperfect and erroneous faith is still commendable and respectable, if you think about it. Because of even the trust that they have there to keep doing what they're doing, knock, knocking on doors and sharing their vantage point or perspective of the faith. Not understanding or ever knowing whether or not God will show mercy upon them or upon anybody else in that circle that are going door to door. I mean, you think about that for a moment and, you know, they come up to you at Winchell's and, hey, would you like something? Like, no, thank you. I, but I appreciate what you're doing because you're, you're making this world a better place and you're good people and that's good. But I believe in Jesus and I believe that I put my trust in Jesus and I believe that I'm, I've received my eternal salvation. And although God is the ultimate judge and I'll stand before him one day and he'll be on the throne and he'll let me know um, whether or not that is true or not, um, I, I would rather put my faith in Jesus. I'd rather put my, my trust in God. There's another verse in Ephesians chapter 4.15 and after this, you highlight that. We'll close in prayer. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Talking about building one another up in love. Talking about being able to put our faith in Jesus. So not only is Paul showing us something very practical about our faith, not only is Paul uh, underscoring some of this, these aspects of the Christian faith that are to be uh, modeled or lived out, but the greater truth of what Paul is doing is that he loved his people so much that he loved those who did not know Jesus so much that he was willing to stick his neck out for them. Even with the chance that they would reject him, that they would spit in his face, that they would say, keep your stuff to yourself. You think that you're all that. You think that your faith is the right faith and everybody's wrong. You know, we live in a pluralistic society. We live in a world where people say there are more than one way to heaven. That, that everybody, you know, as long as they're good people and have their own faith and, and do their own thing and are good folks, they're all going to go to heaven. And 
But the Bible, which is where we stand upon, and the Bible, which is our authority, the Bible, which is the inspired word of God that he gave to us through his men who uh, the Holy Spirit led to tell the story of God, point to a man from Nazareth named Jesus, who was the son of God, who came from heaven to earth to die for the sins of the world that we might have eternal life. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Mm -hmm.